Thousands of years ago, the ancient Greeks proposed the task of constructing a square and a circle in a finite number of steps with an identical surface area using just a compass and straight edge. This task would be attempted by numerous Greeks and Renaissance scholars until eventually being proven in 1892 as impossible on account of the nature of pi. Numerous approximate solutions have been proposed, however, and perhaps the most famous of which is Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. The Vitruvian Man was sketched by da Vinci in 1490 and was heavily influenced by the 1st century BC Roman temple architect Vitruvius. In this book, Vitruvius wrote, Just so the parts of temples should correspond with each other and with the whole. The navel is naturally placed in the center of the human body, and if a man lying with his face upward and his hands and feet extended from his navel as the center, a circle be described, it will touch his fingers and toes. It is not alone by a circle that the human body is thus circumscribed, as may be seen by placing it within a square. For measuring from the feet to the crown of the head and then across the arms fully extended, we find the latter measure equal to the former, so that lines at right angles to each other, enclosing the figure, will form a square. 1500 years later, da Vinci drew exactly this. The result was a circle with a radius measured at 110 centimeters and a square with a side length measured at 181.5 centimeters. The mutually overlapping state of the circle and the square puts the two shapes in a visual equilibrium that is impressive considering it comes directly from the ideal proportions of the human body. Unfortunately, this is not the closest approximation in the world with the area of the square being only 80 6.7% the area of the circle. However, two much closer approximations of squaring the circle can be found within the Vitruvian Man. Da Vinci tells us in text under the Vitruvian Man that from below the chin to the top of the head is one-eighth the height of the man. The Vitruvian Man can easily be divided into eight sections vertically, each section being the length from below the chin to the top of the head. If we were to go to the top of the head and use this length as the radius of a circle, this would allow us to find a line with a value of nine units by intersecting the top of the circle with a vertical line through the center point of da Vinci square. This creates point P. Then, if we found the midpoint from this new point, P, and the bottom of the square, we could draw a new circle with 99.4% the area of da Vinci's square. Although this new circle is smaller than the circle da Vinci initially drew, it does touch the exact spots where the Vitruvian man's lower pointer fingers touch da Vinci's square. Furthermore, a square with approximately the same area as da Vinci's original circle can also be drawn using the following steps. First, draw a line from one of the bottom corners of da Vinci's square to the center point of da Vinci's circle. Next, intersect where this line meets the circle and construct a line parallel to the vertical lines of da Vinci's square through this point. The green line is the distance between point J and the bottom of the square, and it is the side length of the square we're trying to construct. We can use trigonometry to find the value of the green line, which will be this. This equals about 194.851, which means the area of the square will be 37,966.936, compared to the 38,013.271 area of da Vinci's circle which means the square we just drew has 99.878% the area of da Vinci's circle. It would seem at this point that da Vinci encoded both a circle that squares his square and a square that circles his circle, but there's also something inherently special about the relationship between da Vinci's original circle and square. The ratio of the area of da Vinci's circle to the area of da Vinci's square is this, or about 1.154, this is 99.845% identical to the ratio of the constants pi to e, which is 1.156. This means that if we drew a circle with a radius of one, which would give us an area of pi, we could approximate da Vinci's square with over 99% accuracy by creating one with an area equal to e. 
but can these approximations be done with just a compass and a straight edge? And more specifically, can we use a compass and a straight edge to construct Da Vinci's circle and square? We could use a compass to create a 363 by 363 grid, but this would be tedious. However, many attempts have been made to create Da Vinci's circle and square with just a ruler and a compass in much fewer steps. Quite recently, in 2021, Robert Edward Grant found a matrix that varies from the initial measurements by only a fourth of a millimeter. The matrix can be constructed using the following steps. One, draw a circle with a radius of one unit. Two, create a square around the circle such that the square has side lengths equal to the diameter of the circle. Three, draw lines from the top corners of the square to the opposing bottom sides. Four, mark the points where the lines meet the circle. Five, draw lines from the top corner of the square to these new points. The angle of this line will be 22.5 degrees from the center line or 360 divided by 16. Six, intersect the new lines with the bottom of the square. Seven, use the distance between these two points as the side length of a square along the bottom center of the circle we drew in step one. Assuming the radius of the circle is one, we can use trigonometry to find that the length from points O to D is two divided by the tangent of 67.5 degrees, which equals about 0.828. Since O to D is half the side length of the square, that means that the square will have a side length of four divided by the tangent of 67.5 or 1.657. This in turn means that the square and the circle have a side length to diameter ratio of about this, which is 99.586% identical to the 181.5 to 220 ratio of the official measurements of the Vitruvian man. It's also possible the official measurements of the Vitruvian man are incorrect. As far as I know, da Vinci didn't give any measurements of the circle and the square, and these measurements were just done by hand by someone else. Robert Edward Grant has also found that this matrix is able to closely approximate solutions to the cube of Delios problem. The cube of Delios is another now proven impossible problem studied by Greek mathematicians. According to Plutarch, a first century AD Neoplatonist and priest of the Temple of Apollo, this problem was first proposed by the Oracle of Delphi, who instructed the citizens of Delios to double the size of the cube-shaped altar to Apollo. The citizens then consulted Plato, who interpreted the question mathematically but was unable to find an answer with just pure geometry. This task would be proven impossible in 18 37. However, using the matrix we've created, we can closely approximate a solution. We've already established that half of the side length of the square is 2 divided by the tangent of 67.5, assuming that the radius of the circle is 1. Cubing this value gives us 8 divided by tan of 67.5 to the third, which would be the area of the cube created with side lengths equal to half the side length of da Vinci's square. Doubling this value gives us 16 divided by the tangent of 67.5 to the third. The cube root of this value is this number, which is the value we would need to perfectly solve the cube of Delio's problem relative to the original length. The best we can do is the distance from point A to R, which is about 1.057. Our cubed root is about 98.725% of the distance from A to R. Not the closest approximation in the world, but since we can reverse engineer this matrix starting with the length of the square, we can use it to approximately solve the cube of Delio's problem for any length. Next, we're going to look at how this matrix can approximate some of the impossible polygons. If one creates a circle with a radius from the center bottom of the square to the bottom edge of the square, various line lengths within the matrix can be used as radii in circles that split our circle into impressive approximations of 7, 9, and 11. Just like squaring the circle, 7, 9, and 11-sided polygons were proven to be impossible to construct with just a compass and a straight edge. Okay, first we're going to construct the 11-sided polygon, which we do by connecting point A to point P, and then finding the point of intersection between that line and the red circle. It's gonna give us A to U, uh, I'm going to create another circle that has the same radius as this red circle. I'll put it right here. 
Now I will take the compass tool, take a circle that has a radius from A to U. So as you can see, there's a little bit of error here, but still looks pretty good. And here is the completed polygon. The radius of those smaller circles is equal to the side lengths. Next, we'll make the nonagram. We're gonna darken the line from E to P, and then from A to I. And we're gonna find where these points intersect, and then we're gonna find where this line from E to P intersects with the red circle. And the distance between these points, E1 and F1, that's gonna be our side length of our nanogon. So I'll just take the compass tool. And here's our little bit of error. There's the finished nanogon. Lastly, we're gonna make the heptagon, which we do by connecting points A to H. This is probably the trickiest one. We're gonna find where that line intersects with the circle. It's gonna give us point G1, and then we're gonna use parallel line tool to create a horizontal line. Uh, and we're gonna find where that line intersects with uh, this line from points E to P. And the distance between these two points, H1 and P, is going to be the side length of our heptagon. That looks really good. Although it's not perfect. There is our finished heptagon. Here's the final results again along with the true proportions of the polygons. The 11-sided polygon generated with this method has a radius to side length ratio of this, which is about 99.286% of the radius to side length of a true 11-sided polygon. The nonagon generated by this method has a radius to side length ratio of this, which is 99.245% of the radius to side length of a true nonagon. And the heptagon generated by this method has a radius to side length ratio of this, which is 99.835% of a true heptagon. Moving from the impossible polygons to a possible polygon, an alternate method for creating the da Vinci construction box was proposed by George Leoniak using the four natural line lengths in a pentagram. A perfect pentagram or pentagon can be created using just a compass and a straight edge, unlike most odd numbered polygons. Once you have a regular pentagram, the steps for making the construction box are as follows. First, construct a circle using the longest line in the pentagram as the radius. Two, create a vertical and horizontal line from the center of this circle. Three, use these intersection points of the lines and the circle to create four more circles of the same size on the top, bottom, right, and left. Four, use the second longest line in the pentagram as the radius of a new circle, which will be placed in the center of the right and left circle. Five, use the third longest line in the pentagram as the radius of a new circle, which will be placed in the center of the top circle. Six, use the four outer intersection points between the four large circles as the corner of a box. Seven, intersect the sides of this box with the upper points on the medium circles. Eight, intersect the top of the box with the small circle. Nine, connect these points across the center to create two lines. 10, connect the tops of the box to the bottom center. 11, intersect these lines with the lines we drew in step eight. We can now construct a second box by connecting these two points to each other and creating vertical lines from them to the bottom of the first box. It's interesting that ratios found within the pentagram could be used to create a circle and a square that so closely match with the Vinci square and circle because this is not the only place in the Vitruvian Man where the ratios within the pentagram can be found. It's also at this point that we will go on a minor tangent and discuss the significance of the ratios within the pentagram. It was our old friend Pythagoras who discovered that the pentagram was full of mathematic. The two shorter lines combined exactly equal the third, 
And this line shows the magic proportions of the famous golden section. The second and third lines exactly equal the fourth. Once again, we have the golden section. It is not enough to say that every line in the pentagram is the sum of the previous two. Every line in the pentagram is the number of the previous multiplied by the constant 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2. This constant is the irrational number phi or 1.618033398, etc. And it can be derived from the Fibonacci sequence. Each number in this sequence is the sum of the previous two. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8. 2 divided by 1 is 2, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, 5 divided by 3 is 1.66, etc. 8 divided by 5 is 1.6. The higher we go, the closer we will get to the irrational number phi, 1.618033398. This means that the lines in the pentagram seem to quite profoundly reflect the idea of sums of the previous two. The ratios of the pentagram can also be found in the body of the Vitruvian man. Da Vinci drew five horizontal lines across his man. If we were to take a pentagram with side lengths equal to the distance between the hairline and navel, we would find that the next line length in the pentagram is almost the same length from the belly button to the top of the chest. The third line length can then be found both as the distance between the hairline to the top of the chest and the distance between the bottom of the chest and the navel. The fourth line can be found as the distance between the top and the bottom of the chest. We're out of line lengths in the pentagram, but if we were to multiply the length of the teal line by phi, we would get about the length between the navel and the base of the square. We can demonstrate this by overlaying the length of the teal line plus the length of the red line. In the years of the Renaissance that followed the publication of the Vitruvian Man, it would find itself conflated with the pentagram. In 1617, the British mathematician, astrologer, alchemist, and associate of the Rosicrucians, Robert Flood, published this book with an image of a man centered in the solar system dividing the inner circle labeled microcosmos into five parts with his body. In the 18th century, an image of a Vitruvian style man with the words microcosmos was published in the alchemical text Secret Symbols of the Rosicrucians. Then, a hundred years later, in 1897, this French poet and Rosicrucian published this image of Adam Cadmon in this book. Rosicrucianism was founded on the teachings of Christian Rosenkreutz, an alleged reincarnation of Hermes Trismegistus. This means that Rosicrucianism was and is a deeply hermetic order with a deeply hermetic view of God, which is as follows. 1. God is complete and he is the complete totality because 2. God is not only the creator, but the creation as well. Three, because God is a complete whole, any emanation of God will be in and of itself a complete whole. This is a macrocosmic view of God where man is a microcosm of God, acting as sort of a homunculi as the mind of God. We see this idea of a microcosm presented by Vitruvius himself. In this book, Vitruvius wrote, just so the parts of temples should correspond with each other and with the whole. If nature, therefore, has made the human body so that the different members of it are measures of the whole, so the ancients have, with great propriety, determined that in all perfect works, each part should be some aliquot part of the whole. This idea was echoed by da Vinci, who wrote in his own notes, man is the model of the world. The pentagram has long since been used as a symbol of a microcosm, stretching at least as far as the Pythagoreans, whose ideas are arguably indistinguishable from Hermetics. And not only is the pentagram a shape that can reproduce smaller or larger versions of itself indefinitely, but the same can be done with a rectangle with a height and length ratio of 1 to 5. It can mathematically reproduce itself indefinitely. All these rectangles have exactly the same proportions. Naturally, this replication can also be done with a golden right triangle or a right triangle with a base to hypotenuse ratio of 1 to 5, just like the rectangle. 
This triangle can be constructed with just a compass and straight edge, and the steps are as followed. One, construct a pentagram. Two, construct a 90 degree axis. Three, set the compass with the radius of the second longest line in the pentagram and lay a circle in the center of the axis. Four, mark where it intersects on one side of the horizontal axis. We'll call this point A. Five, set the compass with the radius of the longest line of the pentagram and lay it across point A. Six, mark where this circle intersects with the vertical line from our axis. We now have the three points needed to make a golden right triangle. There's a similarity between this triangle and the one we made before with a base of four and a height of 4.5. Visually, they look the same, but this triangle has a lower internal angle of about 48.366 degrees, while the golden right triangle has a lower internal angle of about 51.827 degrees. Although the 4 to 4.5 triangle is more inherent to the Vitruvian man than the golden triangle in this case, the angle 51.766 can be found by drawing a line from the Vitruvian man's navel to the top corners of da Vinci square, which is 99.882% of the slope of a golden right triangle. Numerous other people have also pointed out the similarity between this and this angle with the slope of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the slope of a square-based regular pyramid is measured by a right triangle with a base of half the base length of the pyramid and a height equal to the height of a pyramid. If the proportions of this right triangle were to change, the proportions of the pyramid would be forced to change as well. The Great Pyramid of Giza has a base length of 440 royal Egyptian cubits and a height of 280 cubits, giving it a slope of 51.843. This means that the ratio of the semi-base to the slope of the Pyramid of Giza is almost exactly the ratio of 1 to 5, meaning that the Great Pyramid also embodies the microcosm. In fact, a regular square-based pyramid is already naturally microcosmic, as horizontally cutting off the top from any point will yield a pyramid of the same dimensions of the whole. The following is an echo of part of one of Andrew Way's videos, where he multiplies the dimensions of the Great Pyramid by 18. 220 multiplied by 18 gives us 3960, which is possibly the average radius of the oblate spheroid that is the Earth in miles. The average radius of the Earth is not known to an exact degree of accuracy, but 3960 miles is a perfectly acceptable approximation within a margin of 2 miles or so. 280 multiplied by 18 is 5040, and 5040 minus 3960 gives us 1080, the average radius of the moon in miles. It's difficult to prove, but it's likely that da Vinci would have known about the relationship between the average radius of the moon and Earth. In his notebook, da Vinci studied the ancient Egyptian flowers of life pattern, which is well known to contain a close approximation of the 3,960 to 1,080 ratio. If one begins the pattern with a circle with a radius of 1,080, and then creates another complete roll of circles, and then another, and then another, a circle with a radius of 3,937.41142 can be drawn by connecting the center of the pattern with the farthest point along the circumference of one of the outer circles. This is 99.43% of 3,960. If we were to draw two right triangles on either side of our moon circle, they would each have a base of 2,880 miles, a height of 2,160 miles, and a hypotenuse of 3,600 miles. This is a perfect multiple of a 3-4-5 Pythagorean right triangle, as dividing each of the side lengths by 720 will give us 3, 4, and 5. Each number currently on the screen right now is not only a multiple of 9, but specific multiples of 9 that da Vinci likely would have been familiar with. The numbers 720, 2160, and 3600 are the added internal angles of a tetrahedron, a cube, and an isosahedron respectively. The number 2880 is twice of 1440 degrees, which is the added number of the angles within the octahedron. And 2160 divided by 2 gives us 1080, the radius of the moon. All of the platonic solids were drawn by da Vinci at some point in his life. Additionally, most of these numbers appear across various religions and systems of measurements. 
Now, it was a platonic tradition to liken each of the platonic solids to one of the four alchemical elements. And in his notebook, da Vinci wrote, By the ancients, man has been called the world in miniature, and certainly this name is well bestowed because inasmuch as man is composed of earth, water, air, and fire, his body resembles that of the earth, and as man has in him bones that supports and frameworks his flesh, the world has its rocks, the supports of the earth, the man has in him a pool of blood in which the lungs rise and fall and breathing, so the body of the earth has its ocean tide which likewise rises and falls. Anyway, that's why this image is the header for the Wikipedia article on the microcosm-macrocosm analogy.